Welcome to this video about partial least square regression. In this video I will give you some background to partial least square regression before we move on to see how the method works. At the end of this video we'll see how we can extract components when we use the larger dataset. Partial least square regression can be seen as an extension of the principal component regression that we covered in the previous video. I therefore recommend that you first watch the video about principal component regression so that you understand the basics. Similar to principal component regression, the method of partial least squares, also called projection to latent structures, is a technique that reduces the number of explanatory variables to a smaller set of uncorrelated variables. Both methods are used to overcome the problem with collinearity in linear regression and in cases where we have more explanatory variables than observations. Watch the lecture about principal component regression for more information. To explain how partial least square regression works, let's consider the following dataset, which is identical to the data we used in the previous lecture. This dataset consists of the three variables historic blood pressure, cholesterol level, and age, which have been collected from six individuals. Suppose that we like to predict the systolic blood pressure based on the two explanatory variables cholesterol level and age. Since we have more than one explanatory variable, we will use multiple linear regression in this case. However, it is problematic to use multiple linear regression if there is a too strong correlation between the explanatory variables. A linear association between the explanatory variables is called collinearity. If we compute the Pearson correlation between the cholesterol level and age, we see that the correlation coefficient is 0 0.94, which is very high. This model will therefore suffer from collinearity, which means that the interpretation of the model coefficients will not be reliable because there will be an inflation in the standard errors. For example, the following two bars represent the estimated parameters of the model. We see that the estimated parameter associated with the cholesterol level is negative, whereas the estimated parameter for the age is positive, which does not make sense since the cholesterol level and age had a positive correlation. In addition, the 95% confidence intervals of the parameters in the model are very wide, which means that we cannot really trust the estimated parameters of the model. This is due to that we have collinearity in the model. One way to solve the problem with collinearity is to combine these two variables into just one variable. However, how should we combine these two variables? Remember that when we use principal component regression, these two variables were combined by using principal component analysis. If we would perform PCA on these two variables, we would end up with the following weights that represent the first eigenvector of the covariance matrix. Remember that the sum of the squared weights should be equal to 1. Based on these two weights, we can now calculate the first principal component. Based on this equation, we can compute the following values, which can be seen as the combined values of the cholesterol level and age. We then perform linear regression where the first principal component now represents our exclamatory variable. However, the problem with principal component regression is that it combines the variables without involving the dependent variable. These particular weights have been optimized to achieve maximum variance of the first principal component. We see that the variable age has a higher weight, which means that more weight is put on this variable when combining the two variables to get as much variance as possible in the combined variable. However, this does not necessarily mean that this variable is better to predict the systolic blood pressure. It would make more sense to find weights that also maximize the prediction of the dependent variable. This is exactly how partial least square regression works. 
Partial least square regression therefore combines the two variables into one variable, which we call PLS component or latent variable. It therefore tries to find the optimal weights for alpha 1 and alpha 2, so that the combined variable both explain the dependent variable as good as possible, but also represent the explanatory variables in a good way. Similar to principal component analysis and principal component regression, partial least square regression uses the following constraint, where the sum of the squared weights should be equal to 1. To find optimal weights, different methods, such as the SIM-PLS algorithm, are used. How these algorithms work will not be explained in this video. Instead, I will explain how the concept works by a simple iterative example. If we solve this equation for alpha 1, we'll get the following equation. If we set alpha 2 to, for example, 0 0.1, we see that alpha 1 should be equal to 0 0.995. If we plug in these two weights in the equation, we see that we fulfill this constraint because the sum of the square weights is equal to 1, or approximately equal to 1 due to rounding effects. Let's try these weights in the following equation where we combine the two variables. To calculate the combined value for the first person based on this equation with the following weights, we plug in the cholesterol level and age of person number 1. The combined value is 129. We then do the same calculation for person number 2 and so forth. These are the combined values based on the two variables and the weights. Next, we calculate the covariance within a combined variable, the latent variable 1, LV1, and the dependent variable, which is the systolic blood pressure. The covariance between these two variables is equal to 14.14. By using these two weights, we therefore get a covariance of 14.14. Now, let's instead set alpha 2 to 0.5. If alpha 2 is equal to 0 0.5, alpha 1 is equal to 0 0.866. We should therefore combine the two variables with the following equation, which will give us the following scores. The covariance between the dependent variable and this new latent variable is 20.56. We therefore get a higher covariance when we use these weights compared to our earlier weights. Combining the two variables with these weights should therefore give a better prediction of the dependent variable. If you try a range of different values of alpha 1 between 0 and 1, we see that the value of alpha 1 that results in maximum covariance is about 0 0.52. The corresponding value of alpha 2 is therefore equal to about 0 0.85. This means that in order to get maximum covariance between the combined variable and the dependent variable, we should use the following equation. We then use this equation to calculate the scores, which represent our combined variable that has maximum covariance to the dependent variable. The reason why we want to maximize the covariance is because we then combine the variables in a way that explains both the dependent variable and the explanatory variables. We now perform linear regression, where we estimate the intercept beta 0 and the slope beta 1 with ordinary least squares. Since only two out of the four coefficients are estimated by the least square method, this explains why the method is called partial least squares. Linear regression would estimate the intercept and the slope to the following values. If we combine these two equations, we'll get the following equation that can be used for predictions. If you multiply the estimated slope with the terms inside the brackets, we'll get the final coefficients for our model. Let's illustrate the coefficients for the two explanatory variables by the following two bars. The values indicate that an increase in the cholesterol level or age 
increase the systolic blood pressure. We can also compute 95% confidence intervals for these parameters. Note that these 95% confidence intervals are a lot narrower compared to our original multiple linear regression model, which shows the strengths of using the PLS model when there is a presence of collinearity in the model. Standard errors and confidence intervals for a PLS model are usually obtained by some sort of iterative method. For example, one can compute a non-parametric 95% confidence interval based on many bootstrap samples. Once we have established our partial least square regression equation, we can use it for prediction. For example, let's say that we like to predict the systolic blood pressure of a person with a cholesterol level of 125 and an age of 40. We plug in the values in the equation and do the math. We see that the predicted systolic blood pressure for this person is 1 in 21. Now, let's have a look at an example where we have four explanatory variables. In addition to the cholesterol level and age, we now also have measurements of body weight in kilos and body height in centimeters of the six individuals. When we have four explanatory variables, we will get four components. To know how many of these we should extract, we could perform cross-validation to calculate the so-called root mean squared error of prediction. If we have plenty of data, we could use a validation data set, but since we here only have six individuals, we will perform the Levan-out cross-validation to calculate the root mean squared error of prediction. This means that we should generate a PLS model based on all data points except the first individual, which is left out. We then use the PLS model to estimate the systolic blood pressure based on the explanatory variables for the person that was left out. We compute this for a PLS model including either 0, 1, 2 or 3 components. We then plug in the true systolic blood pressure for person number 1. We can then calculate how far away the prediction is from the true value for all types of models that extracted either 0, 1, 2 or 3 components. Next, we compute the PLS model based on person number 1, 3, 4, 5 and 6, where we leave out the second individual. Then we predict the systolic blood pressure of person number 2, and compare with the observed value. Once we have left out all individuals, we will have 6 residuals. If you take the square root of the mean of the sum of the squared residuals, where n is the sample size, which is 6 in this example, we will get the following table that shows the root mean squared error of prediction for the different number of extracted components. A model with no extracted components corresponds to a model with only an intercept. We can see that the model based on two principal components results in the lowest root mean squared error of prediction. The following plot shows how the root mean squared error of prediction changes as a function of different number of components. By using two components instead of just one, the error is clearly reduced. Whereas more components increase the error. We should aim to use as few components as possible that result in as small error as possible. If we would for example extract all components, the use of the partial least square regression would not make sense because we will then not reduce the number of parameters that are estimated by the least square method. Suppose that we decide to extract two components, then our partial least square regression model now looks like this. The two latent variables have the following weights associated with the four variables. If we fit a linear model with the two latent variables, we'll get the following model with three estimated parameters. If we plug in the equations for LV1 and LV2, we'll get the following equation. After some math, we'll have our final linear model with the following coefficients. We can then compute 95% confidence intervals for these parameters and use the model for prediction. This was the end of this lecture about partial least square regression. In the next lecture, we will have a look at partial least square discriminant analysis, 
which can be used for classification. Thanks for watching.